Aristotle Onassis was one of the richest playboys of the 20th century. He was hideous physically, but he had enormous magnetic charm. Charismatic but Machiavellian, like Midas, everything he touched turned to gold. The deadly sins of Aristotle Onassis were greed and deceit. The most beautiful and influential women of the age fell under his spell and into his arms. The profile of my wallet, he once told me, is a better profile than Clark Gable's. He caused a scandal when he married Jackie Kennedy, the widow of President John F. Kennedy. Jackie clearly married Ari for money, and Ari married Jackie so that he could stick his fingers up to America. But the man with a Midas touch never found true happiness. The empire he spent his whole life building in the end destroyed him and his family. This was a Greek tragedy, a real Greek tragedy. When Jackie Kennedy, widow of the assassinated American president John F. Kennedy, married a short and stocky man 30 years her senior, the world was scandalized. America reacted very badly to Jackie's wedding to the Nassas. People talked about her marrying a toad. But the man who took America's queen for his wife was no ordinary man. He was Aristotle Onassis. He was the playboy of the Western world. He had enormous success. He was enormously rich. Throughout his life, Aristotle Onassis was utterly single-minded in his pursuit of money. He knew exactly what he wanted in life. He had no time for debate or argument. From a very early age, he learned how to use anything and anybody to achieve his goals. Ari felt that everyone had a price and could be bought, but like most cynics, he wanted to be proven wrong. Aristotle had houses in all the world's most glamorous cities. A luxury yacht. A private island. His own airline. A fleet of the biggest oil tankers on Earth and a bank balance worth billions in today's money. But Aristotle wasn't born into great wealth. As a refugee from war-torn Turkey, he arrived in Argentina in 1923 with just $60 to his name. What he lacked in ready money, he made up for in charm and cunning. He knew how to use people, especially women, to get what he wanted. Joan Thring met Aristotle in the 1960s and became one of his lovers. He was very charming and polite and attentive. But basically, I don't think he had enormous respect for women. He didn't worship at their feet. He treated them as stepping stones for his own ambitions. I don't think he ever fell in love with a woman that wasn't driven by a purpose, and it was usually a commercial purpose. Ari's first wife was Tina Lavanos, the daughter of a Greek shipping magnate. Ari always felt that the amalgam of the Lavanos fortune and the Onassis fortune would make him legendary. He was becoming legendary anyway, but he was in a hurry. They had two children, Alexandra in 1948, and Christina in 1950. But Ari and Tina clearly preferred the high life to family life. They were basically absentee parents. They didn't have much time to put in with the children. They were really raised by governesses and people who worked for Ari. The victims of that relationship were the kids. The kids were tremendously spoiled, but they weren't loved. Aristotle's appetite for money and power was matched only by his appetite for women. Ari Onassis was a powerful, magnetic figure with a great deal of charisma. He was also a, a terrific philanderer as far as women were concerned. Aristotle's personal private secretary for over nine years was Kiki Faroudi Mutsatsos. Ari was uh, not handsome, not handsome at all, but every woman who was next to him, thought that he was the most handsome in the world. Harry had such charm, such seductive powers. I don't know a single woman that resisted Aristotle and Assis if he had set his heart on her. His affair with a world-renowned opera star, Maria Callas, would cause his marriage to end. 
he was so proud of this relationship, he flaunted it. He wanted the world to know that he had acquired, just as he had acquired great paintings, he had acquired the most famous opera singer in the world, and she was like a Picasso or a Rembrandt. That's what he saw her as, and what's the point of having a Picasso or a Rembrandt if you're not going to let the world know you've got it? The affair hit the headlines around the world. In Maria, many people thought Ari had found his true soulmate. Ari always said he could talk with Maria more freely than with any woman uh, in his life. They were sort of kindred spirits. But he never married his soulmate. Instead, he broke a heart when in 1968, he married Jackie Kennedy. Maria was destroyed by it. I think it was a terrible thing to have done to her. But Ari was completely ruthless in his quest for power and status. He wanted Jackie Kennedy because she was the most famous woman in the world. He would say, the 35th president of the United States, his widow will be my wife one day. That meant a lot to him. The marriage to America's queen, however, would prove a terrible mistake. Ari got bored with all his women in the end. And he started to get bored and irritated by Jackie. He wanted a good little Greek wife sitting there at home. Well, that was not Jackie's bag at all. And this became increasingly destructive of their relationship. This was the beginning of the end for Anassis. Within five years, his marriage would be over, and his son and heir would be tragically killed in a plane crash. The weapon that destroyed the dynasty was the weapon that Anassis had fought all his life to fashion. It's the weapon of wealth. It's the weapon of too much money. This story is a true life Greek tragedy. Smyrna in Turkey at the end of the 19th century was one of the busiest ports in Europe. It buzzed with commercial activity. Against this backdrop, Aristotle Anassis was born in 1904. The younger of two children born to affluent Greek parents, Socrates and Penelope Anassis. Harry was an enormously well-loved child, uh, especially by the women in the family. His father was another situation altogether. Socrates was a successful tobacco merchant. He wanted his son to join him in the family business. His father was very ambitious for him. It was his father that drove him through school, uh, insisted on him studying. But Aristotle preferred to spend his time swimming in the harbour with his mates. He hated school, and his marks were among the lowest in the class. Anassis's father was, I think, a bit of a bully and uh, had lost faith in his son very early on. Aristotle's life was turned upside down in 1921 when the Turks attacked Greek-occupied Smyrna. The invasion of Smyrna, of course, was devastating. The Turks moved in and wiped out the Greek community. It was a holocaust. Thousands of men and women were killed. Ari's father Socrates was caught and thrown into prison. Ari himself escaped imprisonment by seducing a Turkish officer. I don't believe that Anassis was by nature a homosexual, but he would use anything to get what he wanted. Ari bribed the guards with his family's life savings to release his father. His father was released, came to Athens where he said, where's the money? And Anassis said, I used it to bribe uh, Turkish officials to release you. He said, they were going to release me anyway, and he slapped him. Aristotle was overcome with rage. He resolved to leave his father and quit Greece and strike out on his own. He chose Argentina. Buenos Aires was a vibrant and bustling city, full of opportunity for an immigrant with big ideas. Ari arrived in 1923 with just $60 in his pocket. He got a job as a telephone engineer. It didn't pay well, but Aristotle turned it into a golden opportunity. He would listen in on all the business calls going between Buenos Aires and London, Buenos Aires and New York, and would get a lot of tips from the businesses that were being discussed on the telephone. Ari used the information to set up contracts of his own. He soon began to make money. But whatever it was he made, every penny went into his wardrobe, into good shoes, into good suits, into good shirts. 
Ari had reinvented himself as an influential and successful businessman. He began to mix with the cream of Buenos Aires society. No one knew quite where he came from. They had no idea that when he left there, this man who appeared to have enormous sort of wealth would go and change his clothes, go to the telephone exchange and become a telephonist. In the mid-1920s, Ari listened into a phone call that would change his life. A new film starring Rudolf Valentino had made it fashionable among women in the United States to smoke. Ari decided to produce his own brand of cigarettes, aimed exclusively at women in Argentina. To market his product, he turned to Claudia Muzio, an internationally famous soprano who was performing at the Opera House in Buenos Aires. He decided that it would be wonderful if Claudia could be persuaded to smoke his brand of cigarette in public. He went round one evening to the stage door with a huge bunch of flowers, huge, dwarfed him. And behind the bunch of flowers was his little face and she eventually agreed to see him. And he literally seduced her. Claudia became Ari's lover and smoked his cigarettes in public. Sales went through the roof. Ari realized that his power to charm and seduce could serve his ambitions well. It was a technique he would perfect into an art form over the years. They had enormous magnetic charm. If she set out to capture somebody, socially, sexually, whatever, he would do so. The tobacco business made Ari a millionaire. Once Claudia Muzio had served her purpose, Aristotle dropped her cold. She became the first victim of his ambition, but there were to be many more. With the money rolling in, Aristotle could have retired comfortably, but he was not so easily satisfied, and he spotted a business opportunity with even bigger potential than the cigarettes. Aristotle Narcissus noticed that the cost for bringing the tobacco from Greece was greater than what he made selling the tobacco, so he said the business to be in is shipping. But in 1932, the world was in the grip of the Great Depression. Profit margins were tight. Shipping companies went bankrupt on a daily basis. As everybody was getting out, Ari got in. He bought six ships for less than half their scrap value. He worked like a dog, 18, 20 hours, uh, finding cargoes for them, and then started making money. For five years, Ari concentrated doggedly on keeping his ships working. Against all the odds, he was successful. To maximize his profits, he needed larger vessels, but he had no line of credit. A new girlfriend, Ingeborg Dedikan, came to the rescue. Not merely beautiful, Ingeborg was the daughter of one of the world's wealthiest shipping magnates. Onassis never had a single object in mind when he pursued a woman. She always had to have something else going for her beyond her beauty. And that something always had some connection with business. They were based in London. From here, Ari used Ingeborg's contacts to finance the construction of three of the biggest supertankers on Earth. He found a shipyard in Sweden capable of building his new fleet. In late 1938, the first vessel was ready for business. Ari was contracted to transport oil from America to Japan. The deal would make him fabulously rich. But before the tanker left harbor, Disaster struck. War broke out across Europe. Sweden was anxious to remain neutral and promptly seized all foreign ships in its ports, including Ari's tankers. He lost a fortune and his debts began to spiral out of control. Aristotle and Asa's dream of becoming a shipping tycoon was unraveling before his eyes. In 1940, Hitler's armies rampaged across Europe. In fear of his life, Aristotle Anassas fled to America, leaving his girlfriend Ingeborg Dedekan in Europe. Safe in New York, Ari set about trying to reverse his fortunes. 
In a highly lucrative deal, he leased his six cargo ships to the Allies.